It's so good to be reminded of God's goodness, God's friendship to us. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. I'm going to invite you to turn to John chapter 15. We'll look at John chapter 15, verses 12 through 17. Years ago, when I worked in retail and customer service, and I'll just go ahead and admit, that was some of the funnest jobs I ever had. But there was this saying that I heard back then. It's a saying that pretty much it expresses a common sentiment that would be shared not just in customer service and retail, but also probably in the hospitality industry, the healthcare industry, the education system, and quite honestly, even those in ministry. And the quote goes like this. Dealing with the public wouldn't be so bad if it weren't for the people. <laughs> yeah, that can also be said for friendships as well. Friendships was, would be a breeze if it wasn't for having to deal with other people, right? You know, we've been in a series for the last few weeks called Spring Cleaning, learning how to purge and prioritize and organize our lives, different areas of our spiritual lives. And today we're going to explore how to, how spiritual spring cleaning applies to our social lives. And I think this is a lesson that all of us can stand, including yours truly. So read with me John chapter 15, <clears throat> starting in verse 12. It says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Finding good friends can be hard. It can be very difficult. Some of you have had that experience throughout your lives, maybe as a child changing uh, from one school to another and having to make new friends. Maybe even later on as an adult, going off to college, having to make new friends, possibly changing a job and having to make new friends in a new workplace. Maybe a, a move where you move from one community to another community and had to start all over making new friends. It never gets really any easier, does it? Finding good friends can really be hard. And being a good friend can even be harder. So today, as we talk about decluttering our social lives, we're going to learn about three types three types of friends and how we are to relate to them. The first type of friends, we all have them. They're unreliable friends. As soon as I put that up there, you had people popping in your mind, didn't you? People that you might still have a little bit of a grudge toward, a little bit, a, a little bit of a resentment toward. People who have let you down. People who are unreliable. Some people are just difficult that way. And you want to be their friend, but it's just difficult being their friends. I want to break this category uh, this, into, into three types of friendships, or if we even want to call them friends. But unreliable friends basically, basically break down into three categories. First of all, we have users. 
Unreliable friends often are users. We know we can't count on them. We can't trust them. Uh, but users, they take advantage of other people's resources and money. The contacts and networks or the power and influence that you might have in your life and in your network of friends, they want to take advantage of that. Users want to use you to expand their influence. They're only interested in a relationship that will best benefit them. That's not a reliable, reliable friend. Proverbs chapter 27 verse 6 says, many are the kisses of an enemy. <laughs> oh, I got some mm -hmm on that one. <laughs> yeah. You know, back when I was a young man, there was a band that I used to listen to. The name, was, the name of the band was Sticks. They had a song called Too Much Time on My Hands. And one of the lyrics in there, oh yeah, you really know it. One of the lyrics in there says, I've got dozens of friends and the fun never ends. That is as long as I'm buying. That's the kind of friends that the users are. And when the money runs out, the users are gone. When the connections run out, the users are gone. And when they are able to take advantage of your power or your influence in the world, when that runs out, they're gone. They're unreliable. Another category of friends is the losers. Now these, these I don't mean this to hurt anybody's feelings, and I mean losers, and we're thinking of, you know, you, you all know what a loser is. You all probably pictured somebody in your mind when I said losers, but you've applied your own definition to that. Losers truly, in my mind, what I mean, truly are pitiful people in the sense that I have pity on them. They don't think any more of themselves. They don't think that they have anything more to offer to the world. They take advantage of others emotionally. One of the, one of the words that comes to my mind is maybe like someone who's a hypochondriac. You know what that means? Someone who's always sick with something. And as soon as they hear about a different diagnosis, they've got it. Someone who's always te uh, seeking attention. Those people just kind of drain me. <laughs> Every time they want to talk about something, it's always about themselves. I know I'm like that sometimes too. And they just want to talk about themselves and tell all about themselves. And when somebody has something that happened to them, they have something better. They have a better story to tell. Philippians chapter 2, 14 says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. You know, the, the, the complaining that we have a tendency to do, the arguing about how much worse my situation is. They gripe and complain without offering any kind of solution. They just point out the problems. And when you do offer a solution, they'll argue with you about how it will never work. Oh my goodness, they just drain you so much, the losers. And then there's a third category of friends, unreliable friends, that we'll call abusers. And unfortunately, we have those people in our lives as well. Unfortunately, when I say the word abuser, you probably have someone who comes to mind. It can be a physical abuse, it can be an emotional abuse or a sexual abuse, any number of ways that you've been abused by someone. Proverbs 20, 19 says, whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with a simple babbler. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 11, Paul writes, I am writing to you to not associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed, or if he is an idolater, a reveler, a drunkard, a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. And again in Proverbs chapter 22, verses 24 and 25, make no friendship with a man given to anger, nor go with a wrathful man. 
lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. What do we do with abusers? Just avoid them altogether. And unfortunately, many of us have been in those situations where we have been severely even abused in some way. We know that people who are being abused by someone that they love have a hard time breaking away. They have a hard time getting out of that situation. We just read three verses that said, get away from it. Avoid it altogether. Unreliable friends who are abusive have nothing to do with them. So we have three categories of unreliable friends. The users, the losers, and the abusers. What are we supposed to do? How can we respond to those situations? We don't have to be their friends. We can still be friendly, but we don't have to be their friends. These kinds of people will drain the joy and the energy and the very life from you if you let them. I mean, there are just some people that you have to set clear boundaries with. And some of those boundaries have to be very strong, sturdy, stable to keep pe people and keep that stuff out of your life. We just sang a song, In Jesus' Name, In Jesus' Name, I don't just give you the permission. I give you the authority to establish those boundaries, to change the dynamic of those toxic relationships. We don't always have to answer that phone call right away. We don't have to respond to that text right away. We don't always have to say yes when we're asked to do something. And Jesus demonstrated this in the way that he interacted with people. And he can teach us through his word and through his spirit how we can set appropriate boundaries and balance the relationships in our social lives. Like I said before, we don't have to be friends with everyone, but we can be friendly to everyone, even those who seek to use us and to drain us and abuse us. We can be friendly. We don't have to be friends. Another type of friend that, um, that we learn about in these verses or in our text this morning is unwavering friends. Unwavering friends. You know, when you uh, go on social media, if you're on social media, and if you're not on it, I'm sure you've heard about it. One of the biggest things that people are interested in in their social media presence on the internet is how many friends do I have? How many Facebook friends do I have? I haven't looked lately. I have no idea. I would imagine if I looked, it would probably be somewhere between five and 600 Facebook friends. That's a lot, right? Not really. <laughs> there are some people out here, out there that have thousands and thousands of friends and even some that have millions of social media friends. Um, quite honestly, out of the five to 600 friends on Facebook that I have, I only follow a very, very few. <laughs> the rest of them, I can s s adjust my settings so I don't have to see too much because it will just drain me. <laughs> So there are very, very few friends that I actually follow. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24 says, a man of many companions may come to ruin. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. See, we want the friends that are gonna stick closer than a brother. We want those unwavering friends. And in order to have that, we have to extend friendship to few. We have to be careful who we allow into our close-knit circle of friends. 
a couple more verses from Proverbs, uh, chapter 26, verse 27, verse 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. You know, when you have a friend, a real friend, they'll be honest with you about what they see in your life. You might, it might not feel good at the time, but that's a real friend who will tell you what they see that may not be good in your life. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17, a friend loves at all time. A true friend is going to love you no matter what, no matter how ugly you might get. <laughs> no matter what's going on in your life, they're going to love you. Back in Proverbs 27, verse 17, iron sharpens iron. So one friend sharpens another. See, when Jesus came on the scene and when he launched his ministry here on earth, crowds followed him everywhere he went. Everywhere. He couldn't get away from them. Everyone wanted to be near Jesus and everyone had their own motives as to why they wanted to be close to him. But Jesus was very selective in who he let and who he, uh, who, who he let draw close and who he invested his time in. He avoided relationships with political leaders. He avoided relationships with the religious leaders. In fact, you could say he was constantly at odds with the religious and political leaders of his day. So much so that they ended up killing him. Jesus also avoided any toxic relationship, all for the sake of maintaining a healthy relationship with his followers and more importantly with his father. So Jesus limited his friends. His circle was small. He was friendly with everyone, but only had relationships with a select few. Jesus primarily hung out with 12 men. And out of those 12, he was really close with three, Peter, James, and John. I believe Jesus would want us to follow that pattern, to follow that example. We are surrounded by people in our world, but I don't believe that Jesus intended for us to have close friendships with every single person we encounter. We have to be conscious of who we associate with. We have to be careful with who we would truly call our friend because ultimately those friends have influence on you. Whether they're a good friend or a bad friend, whether they're unreliable or unwavering, they have influence on you. They can either help you grow or they can stunt your growth. We have to be careful and make sure that we are seeking out unwavering friends. It's okay just to have a few friends. Jesus did. And then a third friend we want to consider is the ultimate friend. The ultimate friend. I want to start off in Romans chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. It says, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I love the way that that is paraphrased in the message. Let me read that for you. <clears throat> Eugene Peterson writes, we can understand someone dying for a person worth dying for, and we can understand how someone good and noble would inspire us to such selfless sacrifice. But God put his love on the line for us by offering his son in sacrificial death while we were of no use whatsoever to him. That's the ultimate friend. How do we respond to the ultimate friend? 
What do we do with that information? We embrace it. Embrace Christ's friendship toward you. Again, in our text, our, our, our text today, John 15, verse 13 says, Greater love has no man than this, that someone lay down his life. How many of you went to Jesus and asked him to lay his life down for you? No, me neither. It's not something that we would have done. It's not something we would have even wanted because we were enemies with God. But Jesus says, you are my friends. He goes on to say, I have called you friends. You have been appointed. You're no longer servants. You are my friends. Jesus is the one who initiates the relationship with us. He calls us his friends before we would ever consider calling him our friend. And he demonstrated that friendship for us when he gave his life on the cross. He is the ultimate friends. He's not keeping any secrets. And he says, everything that I have heard from the Father, I have made known to you because you are my friend. As I said earlier, we tend to become like our friends. We're influenced by our friends. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 says, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. When you hang around with bad company, it, 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 it rubs off. You, be, you begin to go along with the things that you know are not right. You know better. But because you're hanging around a group of friends, you just kind of drift away with the direction that they're heading away from God. We don't want to become unreliable friends. There are people out there who may be counting on us to be a good friend. We do not want to be that unreliable friend. We don't want to fall into that category. Even those who do even those whose character has been corrupted by the company they keep, we can still be friendly. We don't have to stand in judgment. We don't have to be ugly. We can still be friendly. I think the verse that we shared within the last couple of weeks is that it is your kindness, O oh Lord, that draws me to repentance. And we can demonstrate kindness and friendliness and it might just be the very thing that God would use to draw someone to himself we don't have to be a close friend and get caught up in all the drama but we don't have to be ugly and nasty and mean we can certainly be friendly but that works both ways becoming like the people we spend time with I love Proverbs 13, 20, and we've, we've visited this verse many times as well. It says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. In that verse, we are encouraged to seek out those who are smarter than we are. Seek out those who live in wisdom. Learn what we can from them. Become friends with them. They're going to be more along the lines of those unwavering friends. And we know in the world we live in, those friends are going to be few and far between. It's going to be hard, harder to find friends like that. Finally, being friends with God, embracing Christ's friendship with you. Who else do you know who would lay their life down for you? Some people might say they would. Jesus already did. See, we're not made to walk through this life alone. God didn't create us to, to just be alone. He created us for friendship. 
He created us for fellowship with one another. He designed us so that we would have and be not just friends, but family with him as our father. And it all starts by prioritizing our relationship with him as our ultimate friend. And the standard and, and the experience that we have in our friendship with him can affect every other friendship that we have. Some of you have been blessed to have good, close friends. But there are many in our world, maybe even some right here, who have not been so fortunate. Maybe your life has been surrounded with users, losers, and abusers. Maybe you don't know what it is to have that unwavering friend who is always there for you, even sharing the truth with you when it may not be convenient or may not be pleasant. I just want to tell you, if you look around this room, you're going to see a lot of friendly people but you're going to see a lot of people who will make some really good friends. We're not perfect. We'll never be perfect until Jesus comes and makes us perfect. But here at the sanctuary, we would love to be counted among your few friends. Because our desire is not just to be your friend, but to help you know our ultimate friend, Jesus, even better. If you'd like to know more about what that kind of friendship looks like, I'd invite you to come grab me right here at the front after the service. We can talk more about it. I can show you some scriptures. We can pray together to help you begin drawing closer and closer to the ultimate friend who is calling you to be his friend. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your love and your friendship. You've issued us a commandment in the very first verse we read that we love one another as you have loved us. You want us to love you so that we will know how to love one another. We live in a world where we need to know your love. A world that's where we're surrounded by unreliable friends, the users and losers and abusers. And Lord, I'm so thankful that you have seen fit to give me unwavering friends who are always there, who stick closer than a brother. But I'm thankful most for your friendship and how you proved your love by doing for me what I could never do for myself, by going and dying on the cross for my sin and inviting me to be your friend. Not just today, not just tomorrow, not for the next few years, but for eternity. Lord, if there's anybody here this morning who does not know you as that kind of a friend, I pray that you would just open up their eyes and their minds and their hearts and that they would see you for who you really are. They would understand your love, and then they would respond to your invitation to be their friend. Lord, help our lives to reflect your friendship to us, that we might be that same kind of friend to others in the world, whether it be in our workplace. It might even be in our own homes with other family members, across the backyard fence with the neighbor, whoever we may encounter, Lord, may we be the kind of friend that you have demonstrated to us, that we can share your love with them. We thank you, Lord, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You have a great week. Be safe on the roads, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next week.